You can even make notes in between time. All this is is, is just one parable. It's the parable declared and the parable defined. And uh, you got some space there to make notes if you want or draw pictures of me or whatever, whatever you decide to do. Huh? Yes, I do. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, we're in, uh, <clears throat> of course, Matthew chapter 13. And the first parable that we've uh, covered, the parable of the sower, we got to the last, the last ground, which is good ground. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> but briefly, we find there's four. There's four um, four hearts, or how am I? Four receptions to the to the to the message, and based upon the condition of the heart. And the course, the first one was the careless. Uh, you, you meet a lot of people like that, and that's the I could care less type thing. They they just hear it and they they don't they don't even consider it. They don't. It's, it's funny how people won't even look at it. I mean, if, if if somebody tells you about a book that could prophesy the future, don't you think you want to look at it? I mean, especially if you don't know who God is. And but you've got this careless bunch, and they've just got. It says that their seed fell by the wayside, and that's the wayside is like that part of your garden where you've got your walking path, where it's compacted earth, where there's no there's no depth for it to, to take hold. It's just, it just blows away with the rain and the wind. It's washed away or blown away. And it doesn't, it's like throwing your grass seed on top of the ground and not putting anything over it or not working it into the soil. Well, it says that, you know, the birds come immediately and eat up your grass seed. You just fed the birds for the day. But that's the careless. And then there's the, the temporary. <clears throat> and those are individuals that receive they receive the message and there's something about it that pleases them. There's something about it that thrills them or excites them. You run into a lot of people like this, you know. They I mean, you know, if you start talking about the Nethanims, the giants, that's what the word means. If you start talking about the giants, everybody perks up their ears, you know. If you start talking about UFOs in, in Zechariah chapter five, everybody perks up their ears. Why? Because everybody wants to know that stuff. And some of the things in the Bible are just well, they're absolutely amazing. So you get people's attention, but there was no, there was never any, in this place, conversion. It's just they were thrilled about something. And then when persecution comes or just problems in general, they, they, they end up falling away. They just, they don't last. It's just temporary. And the first two are lost people. They're, they're both lost. They were never saved and um the one that's uh, fell away, he uh, or the temporary one, he was not saved because he had. It says about him that it uh, it didn't bear fruit. It didn't take root, and with no, if there's no root, there's no salvation because Jesus Christ is the root. We saw that last week, and then the other two. The first one is the worldly, and that is one that believes. Okay, they get saved. At least applying it to this age, they get saved, and. The problem is they have uh, no character or uh, lack character, lack resolve. Uh, that's a, and you can expect that out of this entire generation we've got coming up. They lack character and they lack resolve. I, you know, if you're expecting them to stick, well, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Having been in the jails for four years now, <clears throat> I'm telling you they can't stick. You say, what's going to happen? They can get saved, and thank God for that. But you're not going to see hardly, well, you're going to see a very, very, very small minority of them ever walk with God any amount of time. Um, everything chokes them out. The minute, the minute they get exposed to the world and its system, it, it chokes out what little bit of the word they've got. <clears throat> they won't make the proper decisions. And this is true with any Christian. You have to make proper decisions to begin with. You either want to read that Bible or you don't. And 
if you don't, you're not going very far because that's God's instructions to you. And you can be as churchy as you want to be, but if you're not willing to read that book, there's not going to be any depth to you. And that's what happens. There's no depth. And whatever, whatever comes along in your life is going to choke you out. Next thing you know, you're out. You're saved. Thank God we'll see you in heaven. Now, we might not see, we might not see your parents, your sisters, your brothers, your aunts, your uncles, your kids. We might not see them there because why? Because, well, you had no depth. But we'll see you there. So you can thank God for that. So that ended that, that next one, the worldly. Of course, that's uh, one that falls on stony ground. It gets in some earth. It's, it says talks about a little earth. It gets in there. It takes root. But because it doesn't have the proper depth, um, it too begins to starve. But it does have, it does have, uh, it does have root to it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, not stony ground, thorny ground. It takes root but it's choked out by the thorns that come up. I think I'm just confusing the two. I apologize for that. Uh, the cares of this world. It says there's three things that, that chokes it out. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures and lust of other things. So just refer to last week's where I go through those three. And then there's the last one, and that's the, the fourth hearer. And it says it receives seed into good ground. That means there, there's, in, I'll tell you what, good ground is cultivated ground. Uh, rarely is the ground like it is. You know, the Bible says that one, one soweth and one watereth, but God giveth the increase. A lot of times you have to wait for the ground to get cultivated. Uh, I think of that, I think of missionaries when I think of this. They have to go in and begin cultivating the ground. Because it is hard, it is rocky, it is thorny. I, they they got to go in, and it might take, in some cases, there are missionaries that might take generations to prepare the ground for the seed to take root. And um, that could be for some of you. I, don't, I got saved when I was 16. That's still young, but it, I wish I'd have been saved at 6. I don't know about you. 16, I got into a lot of devilment by the time I reached 16 years old. I wish I'd have been saved a little earlier. Some of you saved later than that. But imagine being saved in your 40s and 50s and 60s. I mean, you talk about, you talk about a mess behind you. You talk about baggage that you're carrying. Uh, that's rough. But the, sometimes the ground has to be cultivated. Sometimes um, the word comes at you, but it doesn't. It doesn't bear fruit because it doesn't take root. But the more that ground gets cultivated and that heart gets prepared, the more of the possibility of it bearing fruit. Now, he's talk, since this is a parable of the kingdom, and there's something we need to talk about here. When we're referring to, because this also applies to the kingdom of God, and that's pretty much how I've applied it here. But if you're applying this as a kingdom of heaven parable, okay, we can't think of, because the mystery of the kingdom is there's a church, but we're not talking specifically about Christianity. We're talking about Christendom. And you've got to make that difference. You notice Christendom has D-O-M at the end, like the word kingdom. It's like the kingdom of Christianity. Okay, That's a worldwide thing. Um, we may be a part of Christendom that's professing Christianity, but we're, we are not bringing in a kingdom in any way. The kingdom is within our heart, the kingdom of God, yeah, but we're not bringing it in. So when you're reading these parables, make sure that you understand that it's talking as a whole, not specifically unless there is one for the kingdom of God, then we can apply it, and these we can. Okay, we looked at some of the differences that the word of the kingdom was mentioned there, and also the, uh, the wicked one that cometh. Those apply specifically to that kingdom of heaven thing, and the fact that the antichrist is going to show up before that. Before before the kingdom of God comes, it's in mystery form, and it's been in mystery form, and it will stay in mystery form till Jesus Christ touches down and brings in His kingdom. So just kind of, we're looking at a whole time of span. Now, we make divisions but before that time frame. But I'm looking at the whole thing, okay? 
um, or we need to apply the whole thing when we talk about these kingdom of heaven parables. So the good ground is cultivated. Um, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Um, you know, the more, the more seed you plant, the more, you know, I don't think the country can, can get enough preaching. I don't think they, I, that's the reason why the devil tries to shut down uh, any real scripture going out. I mean, you know, if you ever walk through it, I remember, I remember when the Ten Commandments would be up, you know, your civic centers and all that kind of thing. They'd have the Ten Commandments posted. They might still be one here. I thought there was one in town, but I think the Roman Catholics uh, put it up. And the Roman Catholics removed the second commandment about graven images. Okay? And they take the tenth one and split it in two. You can check that out. So whenever you see the Ten Commandments, look at the second one. If it doesn't say anything about graven images, you know the Roman Catholic Church paid for that one to be put up. Um, but just reading that, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, that, that has an effect. Anytime the Word of God is, is plastered in, in any way, uh, billboard signs, I'm all for it, man. The more the Word, the barrier. The better off the country is. Why? That Word of God does something. Uh, you're cultivating ground, and that's a good thing. Um, let's see the good ground also bears fruit with patience he says there about that and I haven't even read it I'm sorry I didn't read the, the last part of it um, let me read that he says but he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold some sixty and some thirty and we'll get into the different um, levels of fruit bearing but the, not always the good ground cultivated but it bears fruit with patience well that's what you got to have if you you know you plant fruit trees you don't expect to see fruit on it the first year you plant it do you or even the second year or the third year it might be it might be several years that's true with any Christian you got to give them time um, the ones that end up you know bearing fruit uh, shortly after they're saved, well, they might bear some. They might. They might have some zeal, but it might not be according to knowledge either. Um, you know, there's <clears throat> at least two types of Christians that I've seen um, over the years, and that is the flash-in-the-pan Christian and then the steady Eddie. Uh, the flash-in-the-pan is one that just, you know, they burn out real quick. Oh, they're excited. The thing is, they don't recognize who they are, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't be so... Uh, if they realize the problems that they themselves will cause themselves, <laughs> they might have slowed down a little bit. They might have taken stock and said, you know what, I think I, be I better just cool my jets a little and plan for the long game. Because that's what this is. It's a long game. You can, get, you can get so excited, so caught up that you don't even realize the devil's working on you. He will throw you some curves. Um, Romans 5.3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Just think if you'd have known that when you got saved, that you had plenty of trouble coming your way, and that trouble was going to work patience within you. Um, that's probably true of plants. You know, they get all kinds of bugs and blight and... Uh, uh, they either starve with water or too much water, you know, and it takes some time for them to, to pull through that. We, we've got a, a, a tree in our yard, and I, don't tell you, I can't tell you how many times I nearly mowed it over because the thing was a twig for about five years. I mean, it's just a twig sticking out of the ground. And I'd mow around. I'm like, oh, well, you know, why cumbereth it the ground? Yeah, I'm just going to mow it over, you know, just... But I, you know, she'd get on me. She'd say, Doug, well, that thing's finally taken off now. And it's, you know, it's probably eight, nine feet tall, you know. And I mean, it's, it's still not very thick, but it's a, is that an elm or a maple? It's a maple, hardwood. You know, hardwood trees, when you plant them, I mean, you're not going to have a tree this thick around in, in a couple of years. You're looking at 20 years. Your grandchildren might see it <laughs> that big, but you won't. And, but I remember just waiting on that thing, and I thought, it's never going to make it. It's never going to make it. It's never going to make it. It made it, but it took some time. So, you know, when folks just get saved, give them some time. I encourage them, just sit, listen, 
pay attention, study, read your Bible, go to church. If you can just do those things, if you can spend a little time in prayer every day, you will grow, and you will grow steadily. There won't be any stunt in your growth. You'll just grow steadily, and, and before you know it, you'll be bearing fruit. Uh, Luke 21, 19 Luke 21, 19, it says, In your patience possess ye your souls. Okay. That, that verse is so deep I don't even know. But it says, In your patience possess ye your souls. You've got to have some patience about this. And I know that uh, sometimes preachers get impatient uh, with the sheep of their flock. Well, I remember being one of them sheep. And I remember the things that I went through. And I remember how disappointing I was to myself. So I realize that you can go through the same things. The thing is, the minute you get out, that one that's among thorns, the minute you get choked out and you're out of the thing, you're out. There is not a possibility of the world of you bearing fruit at that point. you got to stay in this thing. Doesn't matter whether you're wounded, doesn't matter whether you're bleeding, doesn't matter whether you know you've got scars all over you. Stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. You kind of owe that to the Lord. You know you do. You don't owe it to me. You don't owe me a thing. You don't even know it to one another, but you do owe the Lord that. So, and then he says there about the, the fruit bearers, the different levels of fruit bearing is uh, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I'm just going to give you, there's a couple examples of that, but I'm going to give you one that you can relate to. Jesus Christ had 12 disciples, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll count Matthias in that, since he was the one that made up the 12th place, but he had 12 disciples, and that would picture the 30-fold, okay? That would picture the 30-fold group as a whole. Um, and then Peter, James, and John were the inner circle, See, Jesus Christ had an inner circle many times. He just invited Peter, James, and John, and he didn't invite the rest of them. So they have this inner circle. There's your 60-fold Christians. And then you have John. You have John who is right next to the, the Lord's heart, and he would be your 100-fold. Um, the thing about John, I realize, I'm saying as a whole, Peter, James, and John, but when we talk about John, uh, isn't our song near to the heart of God? That would be John. He's leaning upon his breast, and, he, and it says that John is that disciple whom Jesus loves. It says it five times. Now, obviously, John is a type of the church. His word means beloved, and Jesus Christ is dying for his beloved, uh, for the church. But John has a special relationship the others don't have. And you know that when they're, they're seated at the, the, the Last Supper there, and he says that one of them's going to betray him, and they're all asking him one another, is it me, is it me, is it me, you know? And John doesn't question himself. John, doesn't, John knows he's not the one. And Peter says, ask him who it is. Well, why didn't Peter's the inner circle? Why didn't he go up there and ask him who it is? He said, he can go tell, he said he'll tell you. He won't tell me. Because John had a special relationship. I believe John loved the Word, the capital W-O-R-D. And there's no difference between loving the Word, small W-O-R-D, and loving the Word, capital W-O-R-D. Because they are one and the same. One's just in print. And he loved the Word. And because of that, Jesus said, well, let me read it to you in John chapter 14. Um, John 14, verse 21. It says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Man, he gives John... John gets a little bit further revelation than the rest of them. You know what he says about John in John chapter 21? Of course, John's writing about himself. He says to about that disciple, he says, if, if I will that he um, tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And then the other disciples interpreted that, that John wasn't even going to die. 
that he was going to remain alive till the Lord came back. Maybe they thought the Lord was coming back sooner. I don't know. Maybe at that time it wasn't determined. But I can say by the time he wrote John it was. But here's the point. John's a type of the church. And guess who tarries till he comes? We do. But John has a special relationship. And it just, just wasn't because he's a type when, he's, when he is at that table, there's no doubts in his mind of who he loves. There's no doubts in his mind of who he wants to be next to. And the rest of them, well, they're... Wish I had a church full of the rest of them. <laughs> but that was a special relationship. And it just shows you that you can have that if you want. Um, look at uh, Revelation 12, 11. And we find three different groups, or three different uh, levels here, or at least I think we can apply it that way. Dr. Ruckman gave me these verses anyway. We'll blame him if they don't fit. Um, Revelation 12, 11, it says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, one, and by the word of their testimony, two, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's interesting, isn't it? When it says he loved not their lives unto the death, the Bible says if you, if, you, if you love your own life more than you love Jesus Christ, you're not worthy of him. Kind of interesting there. I mean, the word of their testimony, I mean, I appreciate a Christian's got a testimony. But better yet, one that loves him more than he loves his own life. And then look at um, Revelation 17, verse 14. We got three mentioned there. says these shall make war with the lamb the lamb shall overcome them for he is the lord of lords king of kings and they that are with him are called number one chosen faithful some folks are just called you know they they may do a little something for the lord then there are those that are chosen maybe for a ministry and then those that are faithful and I believe there's a big difference between chosen and faithful a lot of people are chosen <laughs> well i say fewer chosen but a, a, a few of those are the ones that are faithful. Um, this is, living for the Lord is serious. It's serious business, and it's, it's not easy. Getting saved is easy as falling off a log backwards. Living for him? Well, you just got to plan for the long game. And that is, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, you keep going on down the road. Doesn't matter who falls off to your right, who falls off to your left. You just go on down the road. And what God shows you is truth, you hold on to it. You don't change it. If it was truth when he showed it to you, if he, if he showed you, then you hold on to it. That way you don't get messed up. So when we're talking about this parable, the seed, the sower, or the parable of the sower, there's three periods of time it would have application to. The disciples uh, picture the Jewish remnant that's spoken of. Look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 4 and 5. But what saith the answer to God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now he's talking about the Israelites. He said, now there's a, there's a remnant of them according to the election of grace. And that is that the reason this will apply is going to apply to them despite, uh, who despite the dis disbelief on the part of Israel's rulers believe and bear fruit. That's the immediate application of it. And then the present application is it's going to fit doctrinally because we do, it's a parable of the kingdom of God. It'll fit doctrine in the church age, um, which is the present. And then there's the future application of it in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3 to 10. And of course, well, we don't even need to go there. That's about the 144,000 that are called out, okay? And, of course, they have a message and how that message is going to be received. The, the message may be different for the gospel of the kingdom of, of heaven than the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. They are different. 
Okay? One is one is works and faith, and one is just faith. If you got saved, you got saved by grace through faith, and not of yourselves. It was the gift of God. Well, that message is different in the trip, but how it's received is by according to those four and those four hearts. And that's what you need to see about the about it. Um, now, Clarence Larkin, his idea of things, and this has tipped off something this morning. I don't know if I can get it out of my brain this morning. I'll try. Um, but I began to see something else uh, going on with this. You have, you have seven local churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Seven types of assemblies who typify these hearers of the word. Okay? Uh, John writes to seven churches, doesn't he? Okay? Paul writes to how many? Seven churches. John's churches primarily is talking about the mystery of the kingdom realized, right? He's talking, I mean, you read about those seven, seven churches, you know what they are, they're Jewish, okay? I'm talking about in Revelations 2 and 3. Um, Paul writes to seven churches, and those are primarily about the kingdom of God. Now, here's where, here's where something kind of pops out, if I can get it out of my head, like I said. There are two churches that are the same as the ones in Revelation. Two churches mentioned in the Pauline epistles that are the same as the ones in Revelation 2 and 3. Do you know what they are? I'm sorry? Laodicea, mentioned in Colossians five times, by the way. What's the other one? Ephesus, the first one. Okay. Now here's what's interesting. In the Pauline epistles, when you talk about Ephesus, okay, Ephesus is the one that left their first love. You know when the church began? When Israel left their first love. Do you know what Ephesians chapter 1 talks about? Being in Christ. Okay? If you're not in Christ, you've left your first love. And that's where Israel was. They were on the outside. But then you go to the book of Revelation, you read about Ephesus. It talks about they left their first love, but it says they have to do the first works back to the law. And the fact that the church begins in Acts chapter 2, Ephesus, where somebody left their first love. Now, I realize you can apply it to the church, too, or to an individual that leaves their first love. Um, but then he mentions Laodicea in the book of Colossians, and of course, that's at the end. And you know what it says about Laodicea? Okay, I'm ahead of myself. The one before Laodicea is Philadelphia. Okay? This is what popped out at me. Look at Matthew 25, 14. You know what he says about Philadelphia? He says she, she, she's an open door. Right? It's a door that, that um, no man can open or shut. It, it, it's an open door. But then he says in Matthew 25, 14, look at this. For the kingdom of heaven is the man traveling to a far country. Now, that ain't it. Where am I at? 25, 14. That ain't it. Okay. 24. Let's hope it's 24, 14. Nope, that's not it either. All right, give me a second here. Hold it. 25. Now I'm looking for... Give me just a second. Okay. Well, I probably should have... Uh, I'm looking for where it says that he sta he's at the door. Is that it? Mm. Yep, and the door was shut. Notice that. Yep, 
he's waiting on him with the door shut. And there's another one where he talks about he's okay. Verse ten. Maybe I, maybe it was ten instead of fourteen. Huh? He says, but he he uh, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. That's a door that he only he could open and a door that only he could shut. And that's what it says about that field. What I'm getting at is those seven churches over there picture maybe year by year. Because what happens before the end? You have a post-tribulation rapture where some of those, those tribulation saints go up before the very end. They go up to the wedding, right? That's Philadelphia. And then what happens in Laodicea? It says that they have to overcome. They have to overcome. That's what it says, the last part of the, uh, when, it, when it deals with that, um, the Laodicean church. Now, why I did all that, I don't know. I'm just ahead of myself here. But you have, um, this, this parable is going to apply to three different groups, the disciples during Jesus' day, presently, and in the future, tribulation saints, and how the message is going to be received. Okay, Larkin, um, Larkin did some statistics on it using those seven churches also as part of it. And here's how he worked it out. He said only one convert out of six really takes the matter to heart because only the Philadelphia church has, there's, there's no criticism of the church of Philadelphia mentioned in Revelation chapter 3. So he says one out of six converts uh, takes the matter to heart. And then if you look at the four hearts, the ground of each of those hearts, he said two converts out of four actually get saved. And of course, and one of them is living a life that does not indicate uh, its profession. So out of all the professions, half of them are lost. Now I think that has to be that's not saying that, oh, half the church is lost. No, no, no. When you look at individual churches where, the, where uh, salvation is taught, repentance and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, you may have 100%. And, uh, and Lord willing, we have that here. But in other churches, you may only have 10% of those people saved. But as a whole, you know, you might have half and half on a world Christendom. <laughs> okay. Um, so it has to be more aligned with the church's doctrine. Uh, half of the people that hear the truth forget it or desert it because it affects any change in their, or, or excuse me, before it affects any change in their heart or nature. Uh, I have met people that told me they were lost, but then when I started asking them about, you know, going to church, and they, well, did you ever ask Jesus Christ to save you? Yeah, I did that. Well, when did you do that? Well, I did that in Sunday school. Can a person forget they were saved? Yes. Now, I don't think they're going to forget unless they're very old, and that's possible, but I don't think they're going, just thank God, he, God doesn't forget. But I think they can for, forget a lot of things but you're not going to forget that time when you accepted Christ as your Savior. I'm talking about before you hit old age and forget everything. So, um, so when I'm talking to someone, I ask them, was there a time? Do you remember a time? Do you remember bowing your head, accepting Christ as your Savior? Do you remember that you knew that you were going to go to hell and you needed to be saved? Do you remember that? Okay, that's, that's what you're looking for, folks. That they, If they remember that time, they could have forgotten. Um, the Bible talks about though that, that forgotten they were purged from their old sins. Very possible for that to happen. Um, but most people, they don't forget they got saved, but they have deserted uh, church, they've deserted the Word of God to the point where it doesn't have any, it doesn't cha change their heart in any way. It doesn't change their life in any way, their heart or nature. So those are the, the applications for for that parable, the parable of the sower. Let's get into a little bit of this uh, before I butcher anything more out of this one. Let's get into the mystery of the wheat and tares. Again, this would be considered about Christendom versus Christianity. 
Um, Christianity may be a part of Christendom, but there's a lot of Christendom that's not a part of Christianity. Does that make sense? Christendom, you got everybody. I mean, even the Jehovah Witnesses could be involved, could be uh, the, the Seventh Day Adventists, the Mormons, Roman Catholicism, uh, the, the Protestants of every. They're all part of Christendom. Okay, um, so that's a that's a pretty broad brush that we're talking about here. So look at Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 24. And I really don't have time to do this, do I? Maybe we'll read through it, and then we'll, we'll start next week. Um, Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30. And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? He said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Notice he says there that uh, when we look at the explanation in verse 36, that uh, he said, Let both grow together. Okay? That separates us from the Muslims. That separates us from the Catholics. That separates us from some Calvinist who believe in killing their enemies. We're not here to wipe out the other side, are we? We're not here to wipe out the fakers. We're not here to wipe out the tares, those that appear as Christians but are not, not like the Muslims are. We grow together with them. The wheat and the tares grow together. Now, it's the Lord's duty at the end to take care of that thing. I just want you to see that because, you know, I believe in militant Christianity, but not that kind of militant Christianity. We've got to tolerate them until the Lord gets us out of here. But be assured of one thing. He is gathering them together for burning. Look what he says here in verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house, and his disciples came in him, saying, Declare to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. He didn't say the field is the church. That's why I'm saying Christendom, broad brush. Okay? The field is the world. If you make the field of the church, then we, you know, that means you want to have a bunch of lost people uh, in your congregation. Now, we want them in here to hear the gospel, but we don't want them in here as members of the church. You want saved people to be members of the church. You figure, if, if that thing holds true about the parable of the sower, that... In a lot of churches, man, they're probably doing good at 50%. They got 50% of their congregation saved. It's probably more like 75% of them are lost, and they are running the church. Uh, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. In this case, it's going to be Christians, because that's what he's talking about, this time frame. Remember, the kingdom's in mystery form. What's there? A church is there. So we're the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. And the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And he will, man, he loves to sow tares. You know, do you know the thing about tares? Do you know that tares can't live without wheat? They do not exist without wheat. They need, they need the wheat to... to there's such a there's there's such a counterfeit you can't tell the difference, but they actually need them. So, excuse me, tares are not weeds. Okay, they are actually sown alongside the wheat. In this case, the devil is the one that sows the tares, and you say usually they're in this world they're sown together with the wheat, but Jesus Christ ain't sowing no tares. He's only sowing good seed in the ground, right? So it says the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Then he says the harvest is the end of the world. Now, careful what you... Remember, we're doing a broad brush here? We're talking about the whole harvest. 
okay? When the, when we know that there are three parts to the first resurrection. Christ was raised, first part. Rapture of the church, second part. Third part, post-tribulation rapture. Bible says, blessed he that hath part in the first resurrection. Okay? We're talking about that harvest. And then the final harvest, when he harvests what? He harvests the lost. Okay? This is going to have application to the tribulation. Also have application, it could have application to um, the great white throne judgment. But even at the end of the tribulation, the first harvest, is, or the harvest of the, of the, ah, the first resurrection is complete. But then he harvests, there's two separate harvests here. One where he harvests the, 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 the saints, and the second harvest is when he harvests the unsaved, and he, he reaps, he, he uh, well, I am having a time today. I know what I want to say, just can't get it out of my mouth. When you harvest wheat, you know you, you, you cut it, right? You see it's cut, because what's left is straw. I mean, they bale that, okay. You, but the same way it is true with the tear. You don't pull tears out like weeds. You harvest them like you would the wheat, but you come through and you cut them too. And he's going to, it talks about him gathering that, gathering those tears. He's doing that now. He's gathering them for a future burning, okay? But then he's going to gather the wheat to his barn. And we'll get into all that next week because I need to just shut up. I'm having a terrible time here. So, just real quickly, def definition of terms. The sower of the good seed is the son of man. The good seed is the children of the kingdom who are likened to wheat. And when you think about wheat, um, the, the hull of the wheat is called chaff. And the wheat has weight to it. And the difference between the wheat and the Bible says, what is the wheat to the chaff? When they used to, they called it a winnowing floor, they would throw the wheat in the air and the holes and that lightweight stuff would just blow away. And the wheat would fall to the ground. It has weight to it. And, and of course, the fact that the tares themselves have no fruit on them at all. They're just a counterfeit. They look good. You can't, it's nearly impossible to tell the difference. And then, even if you could, how are you going to root them all out without messing up your whole field? That's the reason why the Lord said, let them grow together. So whether we like it or not, we've got tares everywhere. We've got tares in churches. We've got tares, I mean, they're just everywhere. Uh, the field is the world, and it's a world system. Because we're going to find out that we come to the end of this thing. It's not the end of everything. It's the end of this world system. Of course, the tares are counterfeit believers who resemble wheat but have no fruit. The enemy is the devil who sows the tares among the wheat. The harvest is the end of this world system. And the reapers are the angels. The only thing you're not given a definition for is the fire. That's because it's real fire. So we'll, we'll get into this mystery next week. Is there any questions? My brain is so mixed up right now, I should have never tried to... Anyway. You know, I don't know. I, that's possible. I don't know. I know it wouldn't get... It wouldn't even have to because it wouldn't get any... It wouldn't get any wheat berries. Yes. Yeah. You know, I read... I did a little bit of research on tares and... We don't, Europe still has some. Um, they've kind of been eliminated now from our fields because they're able to sift through and there's a difference in the seed evidently, enough difference that they can kind of eliminate it. Probably not 100%. Um, I mean, I've seen some, I'm thinking about corn a lot. <laughs> I've got corn in my mind, but um, I've seen stocks of corn that had no fruit on them whatsoever. I don't know if that's just a, a bad kernel or what, but I, be honest with you, I, the wheat, they say they still have it over in uh, Europe and maybe the Middle East or in Asia, they have tares in, in their wheat. I can't personally say that I've ever even seen what it looks like, but you wouldn't be able to tell the difference.
it's that close. So, but I, you know, it may be true about the combines, but I think what it is, the combines are just eliminating all the berries, or there's no berries to get from the tares. So. Okay, that's part of it, yes. Yep. That's true. He's talking about corn there in the first parable. 30, 60, and 100. Anybody else? Okay, let's take a break. So about 10 after. Then we're going to turn it over to my assistant, thank God, this morning. Maybe he'll dig me out of this hole I've just created. <laughs>